dependent on the tissue supply and the global needs. So over to you, Eric. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen here to get my slideshow running. Okay. Well, thank you to EBAI for yet again allowing me to speak at this event. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the tissue supply and the global need. Uh, as, as was mentioned, my name is Eric Hellier and I'm the Global Development Director at Eversight. Every presentation that I make, I like to begin with our mission statement to sort of remind everyone um, why we do what we do. And I think everyone kind of has something that's similar to this. Eversight's mission statement is we restore sight and prevent blindness through the healing power of donation, transplantation, and research. The beginning part of my presentations, you'll notice that there's a number of things that were similar slides to the last presentation that I gave for EBAI, and that's because we're really trying to drive home some of the points of these global needs and the, the tissue scarcity that we're still undergoing in spite of the fact that COVID is, you know, sort of quote unquote over. But we want to talk to start with about the gift of sight and the public health priority. And this is a, a map of Eversight tissue placement in areas that Eversight has been involved in with tissue placement directly. This is something that I've shown in several different presentations where you can see a number of the orange flags there that show where Eversight does have impact. There's also a whole lot of area that's blue where we really don't have an impact in or significant impact for one reason or another. Um, we do have five different offices, one in South Korea and then four more throughout the United States. So one of the things, this is the EBAA statistical report. And what you can see here is an upward trend right up until COVID with not just the overall number of corneas that were provided for transplant from US recovered sources, but an increase in the global portion of that. So the portion that was sent outside of the United States for transplant right up until 2020. And then we see the sharp decline and a, a resurgence in 2021. Unfortunately, at the time of this presentation, the 2022 statistics were not available. So this is the most recent copy that we have. And basically what we're seeing here is there were just under 30,000 corneas per year pre-pandemic that were recovered in the U.S. and sent outside of the U U.S. Um, that number was cut in almost half in 2020 because of the COVID pandemic. And then in 2021, it did recoup significantly, but it's still quite a bit down. So what we're still seeing is somewhere around a four, four and a half percent decrease in the number of tissue that's being transplanted from U.S. donors to U.S. recipients. But that number outside of the U.S. is more like 19.27%. So this just goes to show, again, that U.S. tissue being provided to other sources is, is not really a long-term or effective solution. One of the main differences that, I, that we were, we've been working on over the last several months is trying to figure out really what is the global need. I mean, we, we see numbers that are thrown around all over the place. Uh, best estimates are between 10 and 12.7 million corneas needed. Um, you know, India has a reasonable analysis for gathering the true need there, but a lot of other countries do not. Um, we just, it's sort of guessing work. And to this point in time, even countries themselves, we would ask them, what is your, what is your corneal need? And many of them wouldn't have an answer. So one of the things that we were able to do is take a look at some, some data and try and analyze how can we determine what would be a best estimate in, in the absence, I should say, of actual data being collected. So in countries where data is collected reasonably, like in the United States, like in India, Italy, many European countries, this particular equation wouldn't necessarily hold true. But in the absence of true information, it's a pretty good estimate. And what we started off by doing was taking what the IAPB's vision loss percentage was and multiplying that by the population to get a raw number. And then the determination was that anywhere from two to 10% of that vision loss would need a cornea transplant. Now we can look at two areas and kind of see how this plays out. The Middle East, North Africa region, our estimates have told us that it was somewhere around a million corneas that were needed. 
and with a population of 621 million and an eight and a half percent vision loss and a two per two to ten percent vision loss needing cornea transplants, you get between one and five million corneas needed. So what this is telling us is one, our information is probably not that far off, and two, if anything, it might be underreported. When we look at the Gulf Cooperative, um, we see a population of 59 million, about 7.5% vision loss in that area. So that translates to about 90,000 to 450,000 corneas needed. So what that's telling us is, is that in just a small area of the GCC, more than three times the need of what the U.S. was exporting at its best is required right now, and that number could be significantly higher. <clears throat> So some of the things that are affecting tissue supply, uh, again, COVID, it's still, I know that it's sort of old news, but honestly, it's not done yet. We're still seeing tissue ruled out because of COVID risks. And there are a couple in, increases barriers to entry in some areas that are still requiring COVID testing or COVID negative patients. Um, a lot of places, if there has been recent COVID testing, they do wanna see a negative result still. This is particularly interesting since all of the information we have still seems to suggest that COVID is non-transmissible through ocular tissue recipients from, from donors to recipients. So in spite of the fact that the risk is almost non-existent to the point that I don't believe we've actually seen a single case of ocular transmission, um, we're still all got still several governments that are very concerned about it, and we're still in asking the high risk questions. So, in addition to some of these things like pandemic, we are also seeing that average U.S. life expectancy increase, and there's a significant amount of life expectancy increase around a lot of areas that have that potentially could have a surplus of tissue or tissue beyond what their current local needs are. In the US, we've quantified this by showing that in 92, it was at about 75 and a half was the average life expectancy, which was just over what the high end for recovery was for age. And then that jumped to 79, and it's estimated to be almost 84 years old by 2052. So the, the interesting thing about that would be is that as of right now, the average life expectancy would be significantly higher than what our high end for cornea recovery would be. Now that's we are in the process of changing that as are several other eye banks. So we're catching up sort of with the times and seeing that increasing the age criteria is a necessity. So the saddest part about all this is that the countries that need it the most are the ones that are finding the supply the most limited. Not just the ones that need it the most, but the ones that can afford it the least are also being affected by some of these increased fees. So we've seen shipping costs due to the pandemic and those aren't coming down anytime soon. In the United States, we have seen a ridiculous inflation situation hit as we've seen in several other countries throughout the rest of the world. There's equipment costs that are increased due to the shipping costs. There's just less tissue that's available and that's really affecting the lower, the, the countries that have less ability to reimburse at a higher rate. Um, when you look at things like just surgeon pickiness alone could increase the reimbursement rate of the U.S. cornea by up to 800 U.S. dollars. And in many instances, that's what more than what countries are paying. So it's more than doubling the price. So we talk about how do we fix some of this stuff? Well, there's no easy answer. And I mean, I don't think we can truly fix everything, but we can work towards making things better. Um, Unfortunately, all of these factors disproportionately affect the areas that need to be, that need the most help. So the areas that are most vulnerable have the lowest per capita GDP. They're the ones that get hit hardest and have already been hit hardest. So this is really what underlines the idea that we need to get effective eye banking systems, not just in one country or in surrounding countries, but everywhere that we possibly can. I've talked before about some of the challenges and opportunities, but seeing some of the cost structure for local to recover tissue is always going to be lower than the cost structure for getting tissue from a foreign country. And then supply chain shipping, all of that not being predictable is yet another situation that caused that lends to local development of eye banking to be the, the only truly sustainable and long-term impactful way. 
The nice thing we do have is that as we start to increase our campaigns, we've got social responsibility, community engagement, things of that in a generation now that we haven't seen in generations in the past. So really the only true time-tested true measure is the local donor being the donor of tomorrow, this iBank development program being the way to truly have an opportunity to solve corneal blindness throughout the world. And even as we start to see different things like um, artificial cornea, the um, uh, stem cells, things of that nature that are able to increase the, the impact of one single donor, eye banking is always going to be needed. So anything that is started and made efficient, things that are made better with existing eye banks or created from different eye banks, it's all just going to lead to the future instead of being something that would be eliminated in the future. Eye banking will be around for a while in some form or another. So really what this comes down to is a call that we all need to work together, get these collaborations going, find as many partnerships as we can. Um, it's just too big of an opportunity to tackle by one person, one eye bank, one organization, no matter how big they are. So. Really the idea is, is that we need to find groups like EBAI, groups like GABA, US I banks that are willing to come together and say, how can we collaborate? How can we bring these resources together? And what can we do to try and make things incrementally better so that fewer people have to go without sight? Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I am free. To, I am happy to answer them. My email address, if you have anything in the future is right there. Thanks, Eric. Can I ask one question? Mm -hmm. uh, in 2022, the collection is is it back to pre-COVID or is still less? No. No, we're still the, the numbers are still are still low. And one of the things that this has done is it's changed some of the criteria that a lot of surgeons have had. So where you know, some of the U.S. surgeons used to be really super picky about what they wanted. Um, they're not as picky anymore. So even some of the tissue that we had available after U.S. surgeons were had met their needs, it's a lower pool and the quality, the perceived quality. I hate saying quality because there's a lot of science behind showing that uh, quality isn't necessarily what we think it is. So we are seeing a, just a, a significant shift in many, many ways. Um, where before we were trying to find opportunities to place the tissue, now we unfortunately can't fulfill all the requests that we're getting, sadly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so maybe one more question before we ask others. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the average waiting time for a surgeon? If they ask for it is so, is it completely zero day? or one day, or sometimes it takes a little bit more. Are you talking a US surgeon or a surgeon yes, outside yes, of the US, yes, a US surgeon? Yes. There's really not much of a wait in the US even to this point. Um, we're still scheduling surgeries several you know, weeks out, months out. Really the only time that a US surgeon runs into an issue with tissue is if they are being particularly picky about their um, their tissue parameters, uh, to then it might be challenging to meet. So, you know, if a surgeon wants something that's, if they have a younger donor, a younger recipient, and they want, you know, a 35 or less with a 3000 cell count and death to surgery interval of four days with, you know, 12 hour death to preservation, that, that might take a week or two for us to come up with. We might have it, we might not, but, um, that's really the only time that U.S. surgeons are waiting that I'm aware of. Thanks a lot for presenting in order. Yes. <laughs>